your beatitudes, eminences, graces, excellencies, reverend fathers, sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ. Good afternoon to one and all. I consider it a privilege to speak at the 23rd CBCI Bishops Theologians Colloquium 2022. The topic given to me is Towards a Synodal Leadership Paradigm, Johannine Perspectives. Any biblical or theological reflection on leadership presupposes a context and is conditioned to a certain extent by that context. Today, we shall keep in mind the global COVID-19 pandemic that forced us to make radical changes in our way of life, as well as the synodal process initiated by Pope Francis for the whole church. It is in these global and ecclesial contexts that we reflect on leadership paradigms for our times. The Gospel of John has a unique way of understanding the church and offers a distinct style of leadership. I shall first explore briefly the Johannine ecclesiology and then examine the Johannine leadership paradigms in chapters 10, 13 and 21. Lastly, I shall present the Johannine paradigm of leadership emerging from the above analysis and reflect on its implications and challenges for us. So, number one, the Johannine ecclesiology. In John's Gospel, all believers are primarily children of God, those who are born of God and thus share in the life of God. Chapter 1. The fourth evangelist also speaks of the Christian community in terms of a flock that hears the voice of the shepherd, knows him and follows him. Chapter 10. Later, the evangelist introduces another metaphor. Jesus is the vine and the believers are his branches. Chapter 15. So the church is perceived as a community attached to Jesus, abiding in Jesus and bearing fruit. Jesus also refers to the other sheep that are not of this fold, meaning those who are not Jews in chapter 10. Hence, the Johannine Jesus includes everybody who believes in him, whether they are Jews, which we see in chapters 2 and 3, or Samaritans or Romans in chapter 4, or Greeks in chapter 12, or Gentiles in general, chapter 17. Jesus later calls his disciples his friends, and it is imperative for the friends of Jesus to keep his commandments and to love one another. It seems, therefore, reasonable to underline that in the Johannine understanding of the Christian community, all members are God's children and friends of Jesus. All believers are sheep of his flock and branches of his vine. There is no place for superiority or hierarchy among them. The only distinction that can be made is between the sheep who listen to the voice of Jesus and follow and those who do not, or the branches that bear fruit and those who do not. The superiority or authority consists in the primacy of revealing God's nature and goodness, or in the primacy of witnessing by loving one another and keeping God's commandments or in the primacy of bearing fruit by doing the will of God as the chosen people of God. What distinguishes one member from the other is the quality of life and commitment as disciples of Jesus. John's Gospel does not seem to support any 
hierarchical structure within Christian communities. The primacy of power and domination are thus foreign to the Johannine ecclesial communities. As we shall see, the power of love takes precedence over all other forms of power and authority is exercised at the service of life. So two, the Johannine Jesus and leadership paradigms. When we look for leadership models in John's Gospel, three texts stand out. The Good Shepherd discourse in John 10, the food washing scene in John 13, and the commissioning of Peter as shepherd of the community in John 21. Unfortunately, traditional interpretations of these texts do not always highlight the unique Johannine insights on leadership embedded in them. Let us therefore look at these texts from a new perspective in conformity with Johannine theology and spirituality. Jesus the Good Shepherd, John chapter 10. The Johannine Jesus presents himself as the Good Shepherd who has come to give life in abundance and who lays down his life for the sheep. Verses 10 and 11. The evangelics makes the distinction between Jesus and the false shepherds. Jesus is presented as the good shepherd who enters through the door as opposed to climbing over the fence, verses 1 and 2, who gives life in abundance as opposed to stealing, killing and destroying, verse 10. Who lays down his life as opposed to leaving the sheep and flee. Verses 11 and 12. Jesus is presented as the good shepherd who knows the sheep as opposed to being a stranger. Verse 14. The good shepherd exercises his authority for the welfare of the sheep and is ready to give up his life while the thieves and robbers think of their own profit and security. And what gives Jesus the authority to be the shepherd is the love of the Father and his love for the sheep. Verse 17. In the second part of the narrative, Jesus defends himself as the good shepherd by quoting Psalm 82. In Psalm 82, the rulers are judged by Almighty God for their oppression of the weak and the orphans, for their indifference towards human suffering. The leaders are accused of walking in darkness. Psalm 82 verse 5. The maltreatment of the poor and the downtrodden, the lowly and the powerless, is a matter of life and death to the rulers or leaders. Injustice shakes the very foundations of the cosmos and thus the world threatens to fall into chaos. Psalm 82 verse 5 In contrast to the rulers who are judged by God, Jesus throughout the Gospel of John goes on affirming that he does the will of his Father and thus reveals his identity as the true Son of God and the Good Shepherd. The authority of the Good Shepherd consists in his power of love and sacrifice to give life. John chapter 10 verses 10 and 11. By referring to Psalm 82 in the Gospel of John chapter 10, the discourse defines the mission of the Good Shepherd or defines God's will as a radical and universal concern for life, justice and the integrity of creation fostering the growth and well-being of all the living. Jesus and the food washing scene in John chapter 13. Jesus our Lord and Master washed the feet of his disciples. How do we understand the symbolic action of Jesus? The traditional interpretation of the story highlights the servant model of leadership which is more in line with the synoptic traditions and Pauline spirituality of the suffering servant. 
the foot washing scene is found only in John's Gospel and it is a symbolic presentation of Jesus' death on the cross. The servant model of leadership does not do full justice to the Johannine Christology which presents Jesus' death on the cross as the glorification of Jesus. Sandra Schneider rightly proposed the dialogue between Jesus and Peter as the hermeneutical key to understanding the symbolic action. She interpreted this scene by examining the dynamics of the relationship between the ones serving and the ones receiving the service in daily life. One can imagine three possible service scenarios. The first model is the service rendered by the poor to the rich. Here we have the example of a forced service for the survival of the poor and the relationship among them manifests dependence, domination and inequality. The second model is the service rendered by the rich to the poor or by teachers to students. In this model, there may not be domination, but there is still inequality and dependence. The third model is the service rendered among friends as an expression of love, which celebrates equality and evokes reciprocity. The question therefore is, which model of service is implied by Jesus when he washed the feet of his disciples? If we follow the first model, Peter should actually wash Jesus' feet. Peter is refusing to be washed by Jesus because this reversal of roles is not acceptable to him. Peter did not understand the significance of Jesus' prophetic action. In the Old Testament, the washing of the people in clean water signaled the inauguration of the new age to come and the renewal of their covenant relationship with God. Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore, by washing the feet of his disciples, Jesus is symbolically welcoming the disciples to a new covenant community of friends. He welcomed the disciples to the new covenant community in which all members relate to one another as friends and covenant partners of God. Moreover, the Johannine Jesus calls his disciples his friends. John chapter 15. Thus it seems reasonable to conclude that John 13 promotes a synodal way of leadership that fosters interdependence, reciprocity and co-responsibility. Jesus and Peter in John 21. A third account that unveils Johannine leadership is the commissioning of Simon Peter as the shepherd of the community in John chapter 21 verses 15 to 23. The threefold repetition of Jesus' question, Do you love me more than this? And the response of Peter, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, are central to the dialogue between Jesus and Peter. They communicate a progression in the dialogue and underline the importance and the significance of the event. The appointment of Peter as the shepherd and his commitment to the new covenant community. This short dialogue reveals that the commission of Peter as the shepherd is grounded on his unconditional love and obedience to God's commands and it is modeled after the life and mission of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who knows his sheep and lays down his life for the sheep. Leadership is defined in terms of one's unconditional love for God an unwavering obedience to God's commands and projects. We shall now move to part three, the Johannine model of leadership and its implications and challenges. A. 
a theological paradigm of Johannine leadership. The theological elements of leadership emerging from the above analysis of John 10, John 13, John 15 and John 21 can be summarized as follows. This list is not exhaustive. I'm just going to highlight seven points. Number one. All believers are called to become God's children, Jesus' friends and covenant partners in God's mission. Jesus is the vine and all the disciples are branches. Abiding in God's love and discerning and fulfilling God's will is mandatory for both discipleship and leadership. A synodal process is thus implied here as both disciples and shepherds share in the life of God and in the mission of God. Number two, God's love is the heart of Johannine discipleship. Loving God in return more than everything else, meaning oneself, others, material things and functional roles is the requirement to be commissioned by God. Do you love me more than this? John chapter 21. Therefore, an experience of God's love manifesting itself in the wholehearted commitment to God's project is the foundation of leadership in John's gospel. Number three. Shepherds are chosen, consecrated and sent by God. And this we see in John chapters 10 and 21. As consecrated and sent by the Father, the leaders participate in the work of God, which would imply joyful detachment from the idea of accomplishing one's own mission and total commitment to the mission of God. Number four, the mission of the shepherd is to give life in abundance by building up communities, ensuring justice, equity, peace and the integrity of creation. John chapter 10 and Psalm 82. No one is excluded, especially the poor and less privileged ones. If not, our leadership leads to the destruction of the entire universe. Psalm 82. A synodal leadership is the only way forward. Number five. Leadership implies mutual knowledge and personal relationship. I quote, I know my own and my own know me. John chapter 10 verse 14, which includes attentive listening, the respect for and acceptance of each one's unique role in the mission of God. Leadership is defined as a reciprocal service to one another as friends and as covenant partners and it is therefore participatory. We are invited to know one another, to wash one another's feet, and to love one another. Number six, Jesus leads the disciples by his life and example. We hear Jesus saying very often in the Gospel of John, as I have done, love one another as I have done. Jesus invites the disciples to lead the people as he himself has done. Leaders are thus called to lead by example and by the power and wisdom of God's abiding word. Number seven. Johannine leadership consists in the power of love and demands a loving service unto death, laying down one's life for his or her friends or covenant partners in the community. It implies sacrifices and participation in the Paschal mystery of Christ, in the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus. Now we go to section B, some practical implications and challenges. The Johannine covenant friendship model of leadership promotes both greater participation and shared responsibility and it is in conformity with the spirituality of synodality. In the words of Pope Francis, I quote, the journey of synodality is the journey 
that God wants from his church in the third millennium. It is to work together, to be together on the way of faith and that concerns everybody. However, it does not take away the difference of function and ministry and roles." Unquote. In the context of our church, synodality includes all the baptized members of the church taking responsibility for its life and mission for our times. I just highlight seven challenges here. Number one, Peter is commissioned by the risen Lord as the shepherd of the community. The evangelist presents the shepherding ministry of Peter as a command to be obeyed as a manifestation of his unconditional love for the risen Lord. Leaders are commissioned to participate in God's work by obeying God's command and fulfilling God's will. Therefore, leaders should enter into a never-ending process of discerning together God's will for our changing times. Number two, the covenant friendship model of animation is not hierarchical, but it is reciprocal. It does not mean that all will have the same role to play in the church, but it implies respect and acceptance of each one as different and each one's role as unique in the church. We understand equality here not as uniformity but as equity, which by nature promotes diversity and plurality. Very often we forget this reciprocal or one another aspect and collective responsibility. It is a reciprocal animation in which each one has something to hear, something to offer, something to learn and something to achieve, always in favor of what is discerned as the choices of God. Number three, Johannine leadership is possible only when we both leaders and members have achieved inner freedom. It can work only when we are mature, free, secure and balanced persons. Inner freedom refers to freedom from within which no one else can give or destroy. It is an inner disposition, the way we see and interpret things, the way we relate with one another and the way we respond to different situations, both simple and complex. Self-awareness and mindfulness are the keys to this interior freedom. God's grace is always there, but we need to remain open to receive it. Number four, in this paradigm of leadership, authority consists in the power of love and sacrifice, and we can animate the church when we strive to have selfless love for all the members of the church. When we have genuine concern for the common good and when we have our eyes fixed on God's project. Number five, we can become leaders when we possess authenticity and integrity. We earn respect and exercise authority only when we establish credibility with people by demonstrating our intention to do the right thing and making clear our efforts to practice what we preach, our character. When we show that we are capable of getting things done, our competence. When we are able to inspire and mobilize the group towards the common mission, our charism, or spiritual power. Yes, we need all the three, character, competence, and charism or spiritual power. Number six, with this leadership model, 
we find ourselves always in a win-win situation. Our goal is to win over everyone and to ensure fullness of life for all. There is a unique place for each one and a special role to be played by each one in the realization of the common goal. It requires attentive and contemplative listening which transforms the one who is speaking and the one who is listening. According to Pope Francis, this mutual listening is a mandatory step on a synodal journey. Number seven, each one is called to a continual conversion of heart as many sacrifices will have to be made for the sake of the common good. This leadership is not easy as it involves an experience of dying on a daily basis. But the more we practice the covenant friendship model of leadership in the church and in our religious congregations, the more animation becomes an experience of grace and wellness for all members. Conclusion We need forward-looking, optimistic, daring, and committed leaders who are open to offer and receive in the process of designing the will of God. The well-being of each member, as well as the common good of the entire church, determine the choices and decisions. The Johannine model creates a sense of community of equals and friends and invites all to contribute their abilities and talents, which will complement each other. In such an atmosphere, relationships are mutual and collaborative rather than hierarchical. What is unique to John's Gospel is the aspect of reciprocity in leadership roles, one another as friends or as covenant partners. This is the synodal way. In this synodal model of leadership, each member has a different role and a different function in the building up of the church. But these different roles or functions are not equated with superiority or inferiority. It fosters a style of leadership at the service of life, characterized by an ongoing discernment of God's will, attentive listening, a loving service, radical inclusion, greater participation and fairness, transparency coupled with confidentiality and shared responsibility. Far from insisting on conformity to one or the other set pattern, it encourages diversity and promotes creative ways of responding to the challenges of our times. Being consecrated and sent by God, the leader will receive the grace of God to inspire all members to live the charism of the Gospels in its fullness and to accomplish our mission with zeal and hope for a better world. The mission of leadership in place of control from above consists in the power of love that inspires synodality. Leadership then becomes an animation from within to build up an egalitarian church of covenant partners and friends that upholds equity, justice, peace, and integrity of creation. Thank you.